Welcome to this session on tendon and ligament structure and function. The importance of these topics should not come as a surprise. Almost everyone has experienced a ligament sprain or a muscle strain. And if you're really unlucky, you may have had a major orthopedic surgery such as an ACL replacement. We'll be discussing these conditions in more detail further into the course, but for the time being, we need to consider the microstructure of these related classes of connective tissue. For this session, we will take a specific look at the composition and mechanical properties of tendons and ligaments with particular attention to their attachments to bones and, in the case of tendon, the myotendinous junction. We'll start off our discussion with a look at tendons. Tendons are the connective tissue element that transmit forces generated during muscle contraction to pull on bones and generate movement. The major component of tendon is type 1 collagen fibrils aligned in parallel along the long axis. Interspersed with these collagen bundles are collagen secreting fibroblasts referred to as tendinocytes. They typically have an elliptical appearance and appear in clusters lining up end to end. In cross-section, under high magnification, the cells have a star-shaped appearance with cytoplasmic extensions creating wedges between neighboring collagen bundles. This arrangement allows for the transport of newly synthesized collagen to specific locations through these cytoplasmic extensions for secretion to targeted locations within the matrix. The microanatomy of tendon is similar to that seen for muscle tissue and shares a similar nomenclature. The epitendinum surrounds the outer surface of the tendon. The parallel orientation of collagen fibers is less pronounced in this region, and it resembles dense irregular connective tissue to a certain degree. The epitendinum penetrates deep into the tendon as peritendinum, dividing the collagen bundles into fascicles containing the neurovascular supply for the tendon. Surrounding each collagen bundle is an endotendinium, which contains the tendinocytes that maintain the bundles, similar to the endomecium surrounding muscle fibers. The myotendinous junction is the point of transition between muscle and tendon. In this region, the cylindrical muscle fibers taper to serrated points, and the three layers of connective tissue within the muscle, the epimecium, paramecium, and endomecium, converge to blend with the collagen fibrils of the tendon. The arrangement looks something like a foam mattress topper, similar to the papilla seen in the dermis of the skin. The effect is the same for the two tissues. The numerous peaks and troughs at the tissue interface increases the overall surface area to strengthen the contact between the two tissues. The interface is further reinforced by the presence of anchoring proteins such as vinculin and fibronectin. Despite this reinforcement, the interface surface represents a weak point in the muscle-tendon-bone interface and the most likely location of tearing with muscle strains or pulls. Ligaments are connective tissue bands that typically connect separate bones together across a joint. Their tensile strength combined with flexibility allow them to bend, permitting movements in some directions while resisting undesirable movements in other directions. The organization of ligament microstructure is similar to that seen with tendon. An epiligament surrounds the entire outer surface of the ligament, a periligament separates fascicle bundles of collagen, and an endoligament surrounds collagen bundles and contains ligamentocytes, which maintain the microstructure of the ligament. The biggest difference between tendon and ligament is in matrix protein density. Both are composed primarily of type 1 collagen. In ligaments, the collagen density is somewhat lower, accounting for 70 to 80 percent of the matrix volume compared to about 85% for tendon. This volume is filled with proteoglycan matrix that create increased cross-linking between the collagen bundles within the matrix. An important aspect of the microstructure of both tendon and ligament is the concept of crimp. While collagen bundles lie parallel to one another along the long axis of the tendon and ligament, a slight spiraling within the protein creates a wavy appearance to the protein. As load is placed on the structure, either through muscle contraction or from forces placed on a joint, the initial force is absorbed and straightens the fibrils, eliminating the crimp. Once this slack is eliminated, the fibrils become taut and resist further deformation. This provides a small degree of shock absorption to reduce tearing that could lead to strains and sprains. For both tendon and ligament, the points of bony attachment are known as antheses. 
As with the myotendinous junction, this represents a point of transition and potential mechanical failure. And theses will adapt to mechanical load, which provides an indication as to the degree of mechanical load experienced over time. There are two types of antheses depending on the site and angle of insertion. Fibrous or indirect antheses are attachments that occur along the diaphysis of long bones. The pronator teres muscle and tibial collateral ligament are examples of fibrous antheses. In fibrous antheses, the connective tissue blends directly into either the periosteum or the bone tissue at an oblique angle. It is the simpler of the two designs, with a direct transition from tendon to bone. The second type of antheses is fibrocartilaginous, also known as a direct anthesis. This involves attachment of tendon and ligament to the epiphysis of long bones close to the joints of the appendicular skeleton as well as to the small bones of the hands and feet. The supraspinatus insertion and anterior cruciate ligaments are examples of fibrocartilaginous antheses. The angle of attachment tends to be more perpendicular than fibrous antheses, and the angle can change dramatically as the joint angle changes. The transition for fibrocartilaginous antheses are more complex than for fibrous antheses, and four separate histologically distinct zones have been identified. The first is the terminal portion of the tendon or ligament, with all the structural properties just described. The second is known as the non-mineralized fibrocartilage zone. This represents a region of gradual transition from dense regular connective tissue to cartilage. There is also a transition in cell type in this region, as the fibroblasts, typically seen in tendon and ligament, give way to cartilage producing chondrocytes. This region has a greater degree of flexibility and adjusts to changes in joint angles during the movement. The third region is referred to as mineralized fibrocartilage, in which the fibrocartilaginous tissue becomes calcified. The transition is somewhat abrupt, resulting in a distinct boundary known as the tide mark or blue line. The calcified fibrocartilage then transitions into fully ossified bone tissue. The complexity of the fibrocartilaginous anthesis has raised concerns regarding orthopedic repairs involving tissue grafts. In other words, how does a uniform tendon graft fare in replacing a ligament with a fibrocartilaginous anthesis? As it turns out, the tendon graft will develop a fibrocartilaginous transition zone over time, suggesting that the mechanical stresses placed on the graft dictate the function. It's also important to note that fibrocartilaginous antheses are susceptible to rheumatic diseases, whereas fibrous antheses are hardly ever involved in these conditions. That will do it for this discussion of tendon and ligaments. In the next session, we'll look at a very distinct type of connective tissue that also plays an important role in joint structure and function. This is cartilage.